Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good following morning. Today is April 8th. It is AMA number 55, a uh, very special edition today. It is Yom HaShoah. This is uh, the day of uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, there are two, actually, today and also uh, January 27th which uh, is sort of more the international day. This is more, I guess, the Jewish, the Jewish day from the Jewish perspective. And of course, we have created this year Holocaust Survivor Day on June 26th, which is just for the survivors. But today is a day to remember, to commemorate, and to mourn the tragic, terrible murder of six million Jews uh, by the Germans and their accomplices during, uh, during the time of World War II, uh, which so much of it happened here in Poland. Uh, of course, here in Krakow, we are very close to Auschwitz and we feel, feel the weight of the day uh, today very uh, acutely. Uh, in, uh, and uh, today's guest in honor of Yom HaShoah is one of the most remarkable human beings I've ever had the chance of meeting. He is Bernard Offen, 91-year-old Holocaust survivor. We'll talk, uh, talk with him in a few minutes. Just uh, absolutely remarkable, remarkable man. So, and, uh, and uh, he, Bernard is gonna talk to us about his, uh, his life, remarkable life and his stories and just, uh, yes. Good morning, Jeffrey Rolat. Very good to see you. Good morning, Saul. Sorry about the mix up again with the time, but Bernard is joining us from California and it's very early. So I don't wanna you know, make uh, Bernard get up uh, really too early. He's uh, very busy. He does a lot of stuff and he's, uh, it's, it's not so easy for him to get up super, super early. So we wanted to make it a little more convenient for Bernard. So we started a little bit later this week, but next week we will be back on uh, regular time. Good morning. Rabbi Avi, good afternoon to you, Rabbi Avi. Good morning, Saul, and good morning from sunny Boca. I will start here just talking about the weather. I have to say that in my 51 years of life, I don't think I've ever seen weather as strange as I am seeing these last couple of days in Krakow. It is alternating between snow and sun, but alternating every couple of minutes. Like it's sunny, you can even see a little bit behind me. You see the very sunny, uh, sunny uh, light shining through, and then it's just a bl blizzard. So very, very strange, strange weather. Uh, I don't know what to make of it, but uh, it just is what it is. So it's a, a along with this very strange period we're in, this strange Corona, 13 months of Corona, Krakow is getting some pretty weird weather. So hi, Mirav, good to see you, Mirav and the kibbutz. Ah. I miss Merav, I miss you and the kibbutz very much. Uh, Sida, hi Sida, how are you? My dad is watching. So dad, special shout out. My dad uh, wasn't feeling too well, had, uh, had a rough night the other night, but now I spoke to him last night. Dad, I know you're feeling a little bit better and had a nice visit yesterday. So I'm happy you're able to watch dad and uh, I won't say anything. I won't say anything anti-religious uh, today or won't say, won't say too much. Corona continues to get worse in Poland. Uh, we are having a very difficult time of it. As you know, the JCC is closed. We are in lockdown. The preschool is closed and they just announced yesterday another week of lockdown. So not getting better at all, uh, which, is a, which is a real, a real challenge, challenge for us. Hi, Michelle in North Carolina. Hey, North Carolina, another place close to my heart. Good to see you. Um, last week was Easter. This past Sunday was Easter, Sunday and Monday. Interesting, in Poland, Sunday and Monday are both holidays of Easter, and it's the same thing in Christmas. So Christmas is also two days. So Poland being a very, very Catholic country, we, uh, we add an extra day, much like we Jews do to around the diaspora in Poland. They like these holidays so much that they add an extra day to Easter and Christmas. So this Sunday was Easter, traditionally spent, I feel like these holidays in Poland, Easter and uh, Christmas are a little bit like in some ways Thanksgiving in the US. Like for, I guess from the outsiders, if you're not Catholic, then you think of it as a very Catholic holiday and maybe for some people it is, but living in Poland, I feel it's a little bit more again, like Thanksgiving. 
like just a day that families spend together and you eat certain foods and all that. So, um, you know, that's, that's what Christmas, uh, that's what it looks like for me here in, in Poland and for us. Uh, so it was an enjoyable uh, uh, Easter couple of days off. So we actually, Kasia and I went up to Warsaw and spent it with uh, Kasia's family there and the kids. And it was a nice, uh, nice couple of days. Uh, it was interesting. I stayed in a hotel in Warsaw and we were the only people staying in a hotel with like 300 rooms, which you don't get very often. We stayed in the West Inn in this big, nice hotel. Uh, and we were the only ones there. It was uh, somewhat surreal. It was a little bit, now that I think of it, and I'm glad I didn't think of it at the time, it was a little bit Shining-esque. So I didn't have my big wheels, my uh, tri tricycle, or in the, I guess it's a big wheels in the movie to ride up and down the stores, the floors. We didn't say in room, room, I think it's 237, if uh, memory serves, which is the creepy room in the, in, the, uh, in the Shining. But anyway, it was very strange being in a hotel by myself or by ourselves, me and Kasha. Ben Myers, hello, Ben, Yofi Yonatan. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Marek Handwerker, hey, Marek, good to see you. Ja tam, Marku. So, Easter, crazy weather, COVID, uh, and today being Yom HaShoah, so it's, uh, it's very, usually this is an insane period because for us in, in Krakow, because today of course would be March of the, March of the Living. Uh, we have tons, normally tons and tons of groups, thousands of people coming through, you know, doing, uh, I in a, last year, I guess not last year, but two years ago and three years ago, I would do seven or eight groups in a day group come in, out, standing even on, on front of the building, almost opening the window and speaking to people, Rabbi Avi and I and a bunch of people uh, here at the JCC do, doing a lot of talks uh, just to, to, the, uh, to all the people in town for, for March of the Living. But uh, this year, of course, that's not happening, all happening virtually. I'm actually doing a few talks. I have the, the AMA and then another talk with Rabbi Shudrick and then another talk after that with Olga uh, one of our members here, Olga Adamowska, so it's who is also two of them both pre previous AMA guests. So uh, that, that's a it's it's a busy day for us in Corona time, but it's not very busy compared to what life usually looks like for us uh, during uh, during March of the Living, uh, which is uh, yeah. So this is the new reality that we live with uh, these days. Hey, Anna Panic, you miss everyone and everything. We miss you too. We miss you too. Was the room red, Ryan Kaplan? Room red, as we know, uh, room red, uh, red room is murder backwards. Murder backwards is red room. So that was the whole idea of what I think Danny was saying uh, in the movie The Shining. By the way, I'm just as a sort of somewhat random thing. Think about all the amazing movies. You can like Stephen King or not, or appreciate him as a, you know, a, you know in terms of literature or not. But has there been a more fertile mind, a more creative storyteller than Stephen King? I mean, his books don't really get much credit for being, you know, sort of very serious books. But think about the books that he's written, what movies have come from his books. I mean, think of uh, The Shining, think of Stand By Me, Shawshank Redemption. I mean, some of these absolute classic movies of Stephen, uh, books by Stephen King or short stories by Stephen King then become these all-time classic, classic movies. So I think that that's sort of worth, uh, I don't know, to me, somebody who is uh, history is going to treat better than he is uh, seen during his life is, uh, is uh, Stephen King. So just my two cents on that one. Uh, but I definitely like the movies the movies made from his books, I would say more than his books. Although some of his books have been, have been uh, you know, really, really cool. Uh, but not all of them done well. Some, it's funny, some of the books were good and not and movies not so good. And then the books not so good and the movies great. So anyway, Stephen King. Stephen King, ladies and gentlemen. So with no further ado, I am going to welcome my today's guest. Uh, and believe it or not, today's guest is 90 will turn 91. No, will turn, yes, 91 in uh, Bernard Offen, who will come on screen, I guess, in a bit. He, we were talking earlier and then, uh, <laughs> then we uh, came on, we went back in the waiting room. So, Bernard Offen, today's guest, who I'm honored to call 
a friend of mine, a role model, is 91. He will be 91 actually on April 17th. He was born in Krakow. He survived 92. the Krakow get. I'm sorry? 90, oh, 92. 92. I'm sorry, Bernard. I'm sorry, Bernard. Because you look, you don't look 92, you look 91. No, actually, you look about 60. But Bernard is turning 92 on April 17th. He is a native uh, born Krakowian. Uh, he survived the Krakow ghetto and five concentration camps and then liberated in 1945 by the Americans in Dachau. Uh, he, uh, has, is a, he is a, an advocate for survivors. He has made, written a book. He's made four, making his fifth movie. Yes. Making his fifth movie now, a one he uh, tells his story through film uh, and is just a phenomenal human being. Comes back to Poland very, very often um, and uh, and and guides people through Auschwitz, uh, which is which is something very special to be able to 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 witness. Uh, personally, Bernard and I have become friends over the years uh, through the JCC, where he's an active member. He spends uh, a, lot, a lot part of his year in California. And part near Palm near Palm Springs, and part of it in Krakow. Uh, he has participated, done the ride for the living with us. He's done the tandem ride with me, which was one of the great honors of a lifetime. Beyond being able to ride from Birkenau with somebody Auschwitz Birkenau, with somebody who was a prisoner there uh, 75 years earlier, I actually didn't have to pedal because Bernard, uh, at age 90, was doing all the work. So. Thank you so much, especially today on Yom HaShoah, Bernard, to join us and to be with us here today. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Let me turn off that Hawaiian music, which I love. I'm, Bernard, you're I'm, looking, I know I say it all the time and you never believe me, but since I met you probably 18, 19 years ago, you are aging in reverse. There's the movie called Benjamin Button with Brad Pitt, he ages in reverse, and that's you, Bernard. What is the secret to looking so good at 92? Are you sure you want to hear the secret? Keep it clean, Bernard, please. We have uh, children watching. Oh, yeah, well, that's okay. It's very simple. You count yeah. backwards. <laughs> Does that mean that's you're 29? You, you, you stop at uh, 21 unless you want to get to the diaper stage, uh, but... but uh, yeah, you count backwards, that's it. So you're 21 plus 71. Yeah, right. Uh, Bernard, so I was asking you off camera and it's fascinating, just something uh, that I wanted to get to. I asked you, maybe tell us a little bit because you told me and it's fascinating. Uh, tell us a little bit about the art behind you. Uh, the art behind me is made by a uh, friend of ours, uh, a uh, black man who was homeless that we met two years ago and uh, he was uh, uh, living in the desert and uh, since we had uh, a spare bedroom we invited him to come and uh, live with us so he's still living uh, with us he's a friend of ours now and he does this uh, artwork and um, he's got, had many successes. He has success. He has a, a, a full-time job now. And uh, he's earning money where he was homeless and, and, and penniless. So- uh, What a beautiful story, Bernard. Good for you. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, talk about these things and help and it's a wonderful thing, but to actually, you know, to bring somebody into your home with Christina, with your partner, is a good, wonderful thing. Well, uh, you know, it was a natural thing for us to do that, uh, since I've had so many people, angels also, uh, no wings, they didn't have wings, but uh, who has helped me throughout my survival in, in the camps and uh, and help uh, to this day, actually. I am uh, also uh, getting some help from the Jewish community in some way. And you consider, you consider yourself lucky, Bernard, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You are a match. Bernard, so I, wanted, I thought that maybe it would be interesting for people, you know, I love hearing, I can talk to you every single day about your story and your life. I'm always uncovering something different. So may, maybe we can start a little bit, just go maybe chronologically and talk a little bit about, uh, people don't get to hear firsthand about pre-war Krakow that much. And as a native Krakowian, you know, so many people 
love Krakow so much as I do as, a, as, as someone who's moved here. Uh, tell me, so you're born 1929, so you're 10, uh, a little over 10 years old when, uh, when the war breaks out in September 39. Talk about, talk about uh, your childhood a little bit. What was Krakow like in the 10 years that you were there before the war broke out? Well, as a kid, uh, I, I loved it. There was uh, lots of people to, to play with. Uh, in my age, in my apartment building, behind uh, my apartment, Kakusa number nine, uh, there was a chocolate factory. And the name of the uh, factory was, uh, was uh, Optima. And uh, I, I played uh, with uh, my friends and sometimes I jumped over the uh, fence uh, to the factory and stuck my hand to the uh, grates of the uh, uh, factory, the windows, and begged for some chocolate or something. Did they give it to you? Uh, most of the time, I got something, and this is, yeah, and this is when I uh, uh, first learned about cooperation. Bernard, I, you mentioned Krakusa Eight in Podguja, where the nine, right? But I have here. Wow, Krakusa wow. Eight. Yeah, that's next door. Next door to you, Bernard. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you'd appreciate that. So would you say it was a happy childhood? Uh, it was a very happy childhood. I was, I was the youngest of uh, uh, four siblings. Mm -hmm. uh, my two uh, older brothers who have passed away now mm -hmm. and my sister Miriam, mm -hmm. who uh, was one year older than I, she didn't survive. And I'm guessing, uh, although maybe I'm wrong, just because of the time that your mother was the homemaker, kept the house and your father worked, my my father was a salesman in uh, in these in uh, terms today he was a salesman in wow. those days he was a peddler a peddler and what did he peddle so uh, my father traveled around the area of krakow and he peddled uh, uh toothpicks billiard balls billiard cues chalk and uh, uh those are the main things to bars and hotels. So he traveled and uh, uh, he always came back for, uh, uh, for Shabbat. And- uh, How religious were you then? Uh, we, were, we were Orthodox uh, people, modern Orthodox people. My you didn't father- have, So modern, like you didn't have payas, but you kept kosher. Oh yes, kosher. And uh, there was a uh, synagogue it was on the corner of Limanovskego and Krakusa, and uh, always went to uh, every uh, holiday and every Shabbat to uh, to shul. And your oh. older bro your older brothers would have had because I, I, I forget how much. I guess one of them would have been old enough had a bar mitzvah before the war. Oh yes, both of them. Both of them. Okay. Both, both of them. And uh, uh, I had by, my bar mitzvah was in the ghetto. It was just my father and I. He put the uh, talit on uh, my shoulder and over my head and did the prayer. And that was uh, the whole uh, uh, bar mitzvah in the ghetto. Um, yeah, my family was, uh, we lived in a uh, working neighborhood. Uh, and uh, we were we were poor. We lived in a one room, six people in a one room. And uh, uh, but I didn't consider myself. We didn't consider ourselves as poor. Mm -hmm. You had you had generally had food. You weren't oh, yeah. starving. So I mean, yeah. working Grand poor. Yes, uh, uh, grandmother lived in the same uh, apartment building. Uh, uh, Next door uh, on the corner house uh, lived uncle. I had uh, uncles and aunts. I had uh, mm -hmm. three aunts and uh, uh, two, two uncles. And uh, 
I didn't know what was war till I came to the United States and I saw and I saw the uh, uh, the poverty that still exists to, to this day. It does. So, and you're native, and you and you spoke. So I, I, I'm assuming that you your primary your first language was Polish, not Yiddish. Uh, it was it was both at the same time. Okay. Because uh, when uh, uh, mother and father didn't want us to understand uh, something, they spoke in Yiddish. But the whole apartment building spoke in Yiddish, so uh, so I understood and learned Yiddish. Uh, my grandmother was next door. She made the wedding for uh, her daughters. I remember uh, playing with the uh, uh, fish, the carps that uh, they bought, and she cooked up a whole the whole uh, reception with all of, of the food. Were they in the, keep them in the bathtub, right? Yeah, in the bathtub, right. And like, See, yeah. I think so, still some things stay the same in Poland. Yeah, so uh, something about that chocolate factory. Yeah. Uh, I, I told you that I jumped over the wall and uh, my friends went up to the highest uh, 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 floor in our building and they were looking out to the factory and they had a great big uh, uh, yard. And they said, Bernard, come, come back because the uh, watchman is, is coming with his dog. So I had to uh, listen to them and come back. So that's when I learned about cooperation. But some of the other things that I played with with uh, uh, my friends in that building was the various uh, kids games. Mm -hmm. One of the funniest one was that we uh, lined up against the boys, we lined up against the wall, and who, who, whoever could piss higher on the wall was the winner. I never won. I was jealous of the, of the champion. So, you know. Everyone has their own skill set, Bernard. You can't be good at everything. That's true. That's true. But I, that's when I learned about co cooperation and I had to share my piece of chocolate with them. Bernard, Bernard it sounds like you know, you a, a very typical, uh, happy Krakow childhood spent in, I guess what we would say is poverty, but not really, is it really, po you had enough, you had what you needed and friendship and, and, and food and a loving yeah. family. Yes. What, yes. What, what do you remember? Tell me about the early, your early memory of the war, in other words, the early days, what do you, do you remember September 1st, 1939? Do you remember the Germans attacking and, and what exactly that, that was like? Well, I remember when uh, the Germans uh, uh, marched into Krakow. In, uh -huh. They were marching uh, along Limanovskiego Street. Yeah. And it was a curfew that was imposed. But I, as, as a young kid, was curious. I went out the gate and went up to uh, the corner house. Uh, I was watching the Germans uh, march. Uh, uh, they were usually on trucks, on the horses. And one uh, German soldier uh, jumped down from the uh, truck and took a shot at me. And uh, the bullet hit uh, right near my head at the wall and there was a big hole in the wall for many, many years. Wow. And I rethought uh, the, the whole event because that could have not, the distance could have not been more than um, 50 yards from the place where the soldiers shot at me. And the German soldier, they were trained well and he was using a rifle, you know? So I think he just wanted to scare me. I, that's what well, my theory is, okay? Yeah. But I was being shot at on the first day of them marching into Krakow. As a 10-year-old? As a 10-year-old. So soon after, so within a couple of years, you know, I just want to keep, because I, I want to make sure it's, uh, I want to talk to you about, I want to talk through the war and also after the war, just because your life is, is so fascinating now. But so the get, you're in the ghetto with your family. We move forward a little bit. They establish the ghetto. You, I, I assume that you stay in the apartment that you're living in because you were inside the ghetto already in, in what would become the ghetto. Yes, correct. Uh, right. Uh, so the ghetto started and uh, we were given 
a family to live with us in our one room apartment. Right. And uh, uh, of course the crowded conditions and uh, uh, just before the Germans marched into Krakow, the authorities opened up all the factories, all the warehouses and everything. And we went out with the uh, uh, little wagons and brought uh, flour, chocolate, cigarettes, oh. everything we could lay our hands on. And oh. we hid and we hid that uh, in the basement. And it's a deep, very deep basement. And there was coal and uh, wood and, and trash uh, in, the, in the basement. Yeah. And we, we lived uh, from that while the, uh, uh, when they marched in and the ghetto was starting. Mm -hmm. Actually, long before the ghetto. And we traded some of it to, uh, to get uh, other foodstuffs. So you were so, old enough, you, you understood, I mean, I guess getting shot at straight away, you understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. You understood that the Germans would kill you and that there was no, what was happening. I mean, maybe not exactly about, I don't mean in terms of death camps and Holocaust, exactly, but you understood to be Jewish was something very different than not to be Jewish and that the Germans were, that you were, you were not, you know, not, you had to be careful not to be, uh, to do anything that would give them a reason to, to kill you. Right. Uh, my, my father, uh, when the war started, my father uh, uh, tried to escape to Russia. Uh, we, we're proceeding the ghetto now. Yeah. And, uh, but after a uh, uh, few days, he came back. He, he could not uh, 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 go forward mm -hmm. for some reason. But, and he said in the end, you know, I'm a, uh, uh, I was a soldier in the Austrian army. Uh, they will respect us. Uh, and I want to be with the family. And yeah. whatever happens, happens. Okay, so now that, that was his mindset. And so jumping to the ghetto, uh, so lots of people started moving in and the walls started to uh, uh, be built on Krakusa, Wengelska, Czarnetskiego and uh, mm -hmm. other, other places. And uh, uh, I started smuggling food into the ghetto. I knew of uh, places where you could uh, get through the wall and uh, traded uh, um, whatever my father, my father was a shoemaker, but that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. uh, and whatever he pr provided uh, repaired shoes, piece of clothing that my mother uh, uh, gave me to, to trade. Mm -hmm. And I was bringing in food. Uh, Within days after them marching in, they started the uh, uh, raids on, they, that means the Germans, uh, <clears throat> started uh, uh, kidnapping people, mostly Jews, because this was a, 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 a heavily Jewish area, not totally, mm -hmm. but uh, it became total when the ghetto started, but before that it was a mixed area, okay, Jews right. and monkeys. <laughs> and uh, uh, started uh, at the uh, gunpoint to uh, take people and they disappeared for uh, uh, many days, my brothers included. Mm -hmm. And uh, just so you get the picture of how it was done. And uh, soldiers, uh, with with guns and they tell you get on the car on the truck and if you don't get on and you see a dead body laying near the truck you get on and that's my my brothers disappeared that way for a number of times mm -hmm. they they ended up being back in the ghetto but uh in in the end they got separated uh, from us and had no idea what happened to them and uh but all of you, at a certain point, you got split up. Just so I mean, to keep you, you at a certain point, your mother and sister were deported, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's later on in the ghetto. Yes, right. yes. They, and then, uh, 
and and you uh, and your father was also separated. Yes. From you and taken. Uh, and it was the three of you and your brothers. Maybe talk a little bit about. I mean, and that was your your mother and sister were murdered probably in Belzec, right? No. When you took from the ghetto, that's generally where the Jews of Krakow were were killed. And your father, you're not sure. I am sure about Oh, you do father. know with your father. Because uh, we ended up in Auschwitz. Oh, you together. You, oh. Oh, so maybe let's, so maybe let's uh, talk a little bit how, how that, just because I'm mindful, Bernard, I, I feel like, oh, we have only like 40 minutes or something, and it's so short to talk about, talk about your life. And I, I feel like, oh, I'm, I'm just worried that we, if we don't get to this and talk about, you know, all, all the things, because you, you, you've done so much. So maybe you'll, you'll forgive me. You'll forgive me if I seem to be in any sense rushing you past something. It's not that that's not interesting. That is that I feel like I would feel terrible if people wouldn't have the opportunity to hear sort of the entirety. And when you're 92 years old, he has a lot to get through. Well, that, that's true. So let, let me briefly, uh, <clears throat> before we get to Auschwitz, so let me briefly say, so a Krakow ghetto, yeah. and there was a Khrushchev camp after the liquidation of, of uh, the ghetto, mm -hmm. and then there was a uh, escape from Khrushchev. There was a camp right across from Khrushchev, which was called Yulag, and I was there also. Well, that's a long story. I got smuggled into the, the Yulag camp. Not many people know about the Yulag camp, which was across from the Khrushchev camp. Uh, then the uh, uh, Yulag camp was liquidated. I am sent back to the Khrushchev camp, reunited with my father, and you, where were your brother and your brothers at this point, or they were already split up? They disappeared from my life. So you had no idea. Your mother and sister, you had no idea, and your brothers. Do you did you think that they were, were somewhere? Did you think they were dead? Do you remember what you thought about that? Uh, I had no idea. I presumed that they were dead, yeah. and uh, so, and from let me uh, complete from. Uh, Kwashov, when that was liquidated, we were sent to Mauthausen. So uh -huh. that's a journey of uh, uh, three days, three nights, some, something like that. And to Mauthausen, we are there. Uh, how, how long were you in Mauthausen, uh, Bernard? Less, less than two weeks. Uh, and from Mauthausen, from Mauthausen, we are sent to Auschwitz. Uh -huh. And then my father goes one way, I go the other way in Auschwitz. And I am in Auschwitz for three months, mm -hmm. and I am sent out to uh, Dachau, mm -hmm. a rather a sub camp of Dachau. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're when that is liquidated, uh, I am uh, we are sent on a uh, death march, and uh, we are liberated by American army. And uh, uh, I started uh, looking for my brothers. I, maybe, I didn't maybe, know I was find brothers. I was right, looking so you, knew that your, you understood that your father, you were separated from your father. You had no idea who was still alive. You, got, you get to Madhouse and you're in Matt, and, and I should just say, the reason that you're being moved around is this, is about, this has to do with work. In other words, the Jews were being, uh, being used, of course, as slave laborers. And you would be moved if they were not to the camp that they couldn't kill you if they wanted to in one camp or the other is that there were sub camps around and there were uh, factories, uh, places for you to work around these camps and de dependent on what goods were necessary for the German military for the for Germany, they would then move you around from one to the other. And, and that's why you left Mauthausen after only a few weeks that left were taken from Mauthausen and brought to Auschwitz. I've heard people talk about Mauthausen as being uh, the worst of the, the camps, you know, Ed, Ed Mossberg was in Mauthausen for a while and tes, talks really about Mauthausen out. Do you remember much from Mauthausen? Um, yes, I, I, I do. I, I knew that there was a quarry. The steps. That, People talk yeah. about the steps. Right. My, both my brothers worked there, and that's a whole, whole long story. But they weren't there the same time as you, because uh, you didn't bump yeah. into them. Yeah. No, no, we were sent from Khrushchev camp on the same train yeah. to Mauthausen. Uh -huh. Only we didn't see each other in the train, but wow. we were re wow. reunited in uh, Mauthausen. Right. And uh, uh, so, and separated again, and father and I sent to Auschwitz. Uh -huh. Upon our arrival, 
father when one way he was murdered in one of those gas chambers and do you remember I, do you remember when you got off i mean just to uh, do you remember when you got off the train at auschwitz yes what, i do and I, can you talk about can you tell us about that 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 moment that memory yeah uh we uh we that means the train arrived early early in the morning and we didn't know where we were uh, but we could uh, uh, see fires on the horizon and we uh, smelled human flesh burning. And you knew what it was? We knew what it was because I smelled it in, in Kwasha also, yeah. in the burning of human flesh. And you knew that the Jews, did you understand that that meant that the Germans, I mean, uh, obviously the, uh, that meant the German killing Germans killing Jews, but did you understand that there was this just wholesale murder of Jews? Or did you think, oh, if somebody died, however, that's what they would do? Did you understand the nature of the Holocaust yet? Yeah, we understood the nature that they were murdering Jews, particularly. Yeah. But uh, we didn't know where we were, OK? Yeah. And uh, I heard uh, dogs, and I heard shooting. Uh -huh. And in the morning, uh, the door was flung open on the cattle car and some prisoners in striped uniforms jumped aboard and started chasing us out. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, after that, uh, let me see. Oh yes, uh, they started lining us up into, mm -hmm. into lines. There were two lines, one on the left, one on the right. And uh, some person had told my father that I should lie about my age. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I had uh, three kind of birthdays. So like, okay. I think you were 14 or so at that moment, 14, 15? Yes. 14. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah, going on mm -hmm. uh, 15. And uh, so as the line started moving forward to uh, what turned out to be the selection process, Mm -hmm. uh, my father said uh, to uh, lie if they asked me about the age. I was behind my father, my, uh, and when it was his turn to go forward, he did, and he was, from my perspective, he was sent to the right. Yeah. And uh, they looked at me and told me to go to the left. Uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the other way. It, from my perspective, he was sent to the left, I went to the right. right. And that was the whole thing. Uh, the, uh, I had, to this day, I, I remember that we looked at each other from a distance mm -hmm. after the selection process. And we didn't know which side was good, which one side was bad. But uh, I don't know if you can have an eye contact from that kind of a distance. But that's what I felt and feel to this day. And that yeah. was the last time I saw my father. And uh, he ended up in the gas chamber. I went to the place where I got showered and tattooed. And, and at that moment, from, from your point of view, at that moment, you had no idea that anybody else in your family was alive. Uh, you, were zero. A four, you were a 14 year old in Auschwitz uh, on your own. Correct. And uh, not the next day after the shower and tattoo, uh, I was uh, uh, marched to the quarantine camp, uh, which uh, is the when people, the visitors come and it's the first barracks on your right after you enter the Mm -hmm. So I was sent to one of these barracks and I asked what happened to my, my father. And they said, oh, he went up the chimney. And I didn't understand that, that term. Not till a, a couple of days later, I understood perfectly what that meant. And uh, well, what was your mindset at this point, Bernard? Because it's hard for me to, you know, it's, people listening and, you know, you've told this story before and people have asked you, so you, you understand the reaction that, it's so hard for anybody to think of a 14-year-old having gone through all of this and yet maintaining this idea, this 
will to live and this strength and this drive, like what was in your head? Were you thinking, I'm going to get through this or I have to keep fighting to, you know, to, to make, to be positive and not like, what, what was, do you remember at all? Your sort of day to day, were you just starving and just wanted to get your, your next piece of bread and soup and you weren't thinking these larger thoughts or do you remember thinking at some day this is going to end and I've got to survive? Do, do you remember what was in your head at all? Yes, I do. Um, I was uh, saved by the block uh, leader, the block eldest, uh, who uh, uh, he told me, take the broom and start sweeping. And just don't let the broom out of your hands. Uh, so I did that. And I remained in the uh, uh, quarantine camp for almost three months. I was not in any other part of Auschwitz, only in the and uh, he told me one day to, uh, there's going to be an inspection. And when it's your turn, Bernard, uh, to go up there, take off your hat and don't walk up there. He says, run up there mm -hmm. and don't look at the SS man's face. Don't look him in the eyes. Look at his boots. Mm -hmm. And I did exactly that. And they told me to go to, to one side. Mm -hmm. Who it turned out to be was Mengele, okay? Mm -hmm. So people tell me sometimes, oh, you saw Mengele. No, no, I never saw him. I only saw his boots. But he you saw know. you. He saw me and he saved my life. So here's, here's the angels who helped me uh, along the way. What kept me going was that I will survive. Okay, I will survive and I will tell the story. Guess what I'm doing with your help, okay? So at that age, you already were thinking that that was, you thought that, that you needed to survive and that that was all gonna end. Yes, yes. And I, I knew that I would make films and that if I kept with that, uh, that will help me to survive. I also had a, a means of, quote, escape from Auschwitz, escape in my mind. Mm -hmm. And that was that I flew out of there as a bird in my dreams. And I was playing with my family, playing with friends, but my body was in Auschwitz, but my mind and spirit was elsewhere many a time. Was that when you were awake, sleeping or awake or both? It was both. It was, uh, you know, in the state of hunger and uh, uh, deprivation, you, you have daydreams, you have night dreams. You know, it's a, it, it actually, it's difficult to, uh, to tell you that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the capo, placed me on the third bunk, the highest bunk in the barracks. The highest bunk was the best. And you know why? Because we all had diarrhea and everything came down the second and the lowest bunk was the worst. The, the, the weakest people were in the lowest bunks. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we lost everything that we, we had. It was, it was an existence, but the, my dreams and the help of uh, some older people who gave me a little piece of bread or uh, more soup, they, someone gave me a, uh, a bowl. Uh, it wasn't very big, it was just about this size. And the bowl was tied to me with a piece of wire and that was in which I washed, in which I also loaned out to some people to because they didn't have a bowl to take their soup or their coffee. And for that, they left me a, uh, a spoonful of something, coffee or, or uh, you know, soup. Yeah. Yeah. So you and, were, you so your, is it fair to say that your worldview now, and as I look at you at age 92, 
with the artwork of, uh, of Kevin, your friend Kevin, who was homeless when you met him and you brought him into your home without knowing him before. Uh, a, a kindness that most people aren't um, willing to do these days, let's say, I don't know, I'm, I'm not privileged to know anybody else who told me anything like that. Oh, I was met a homeless person and brought them to live in my house. Uh, is that kindness a direct result of kindnesses you received when you were in Auschwitz and during the war? Uh, yes, it is. You know, it's, uh, it's gratefulness for uh, people helping me. And, uh, you know, the world cannot exist in, uh, uh, in a humane way if we don't extend ourselves to do that. Otherwise, it's survival on maybe on a higher level, but it's still survival. And we create these conditions by not caring about other people. And uh, we can't go on doing that. So Bernard, let's talk just because I'm mindful of, uh, of time. I want to move past the war and move, move, jump ahead. Sorry, many, 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 many years, Bernard, to, to, to where you are now. Um, how, is it, how is it possible? in this larger sense, how is it possible to not, to be able to continue to feel and to love and to care and to be empathetic, considering what you saw, especially as a child. And you, yet today you are, that, that experience didn't turn you bitter. Uh, you lost your, your father, you lost your sister, you lost your mother, you and your brothers, I should say, because we didn't mention that you and the, your brothers, and they had their own amazing stories. The three of you survived, which is, you know, they're very rare to have that. So I'm guessing that there's a certain will and a strength mentally, uh, at least in, in all three of you. But how is it that that, how is it that that didn't turn you against humanity? It, it turned you toward humanity. Your experience, you, it seems to me, Bernard, that the experience of the Holocaust for you wasn't, oh my God, people are so horrible and terrible. The experience for you, I mean, of course that's true in some sense, and you were, you, the way you were treated and the Jews were treated and others, but it seems to me that almost the message for you is, is almost the opposite, is that you found these small kindnesses in this hell, hell that you went through for years, and these small kindnesses after the war defined who you became and who you have become. It's, uh, it's because I had these uh, angels, I call them angels, okay? For instance, when we uh, march to work in other camps, uh, we marched in uh, five abreast, okay? And they always, I was usually the youngest in the mini group. They always put me in the center because the people on the edges got beaten, shot at, and all that. And I call them my angels. Of course, they didn't have any wings, but uh, it's they were doing what I call the Good Samaritan uh, uh, way, which is, Maybe if I help this kid, maybe someone will help my son or daughter or wife or what, whoever. And <clears throat> I, not to lose, so people didn't lose that. You 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 saw that many people didn't lose their humanity. Exactly, and it is because of, because of them that I could not go any other way other than be mindful of how we as human beings treat one another. So Bernard, how, what, what lessons do we need today, Bernard? Uh, you at 892 have led an amazing life. Uh, the Holocaust is something that's taught around the world, uh, in many places at least, most places. Um, and it's always complicated for me what the lessons of the Holocaust should be. What do you think today on Yom HaShoah what should the lessons be of the Holocaust? What are we supposed to learn from it? If we do not uh, treat other people as holy beings, we create the very opposite which happened to, to us, as particularly as Jews, but not just as Jews. There were many, many millions of others who perished also. We create that negative, uh, hateful, fearful, uh, 
existence. And as, as, as people, and we call ourselves a civilization, and uh, if you write the word civilization, you're supposed to write it in the capital C. I don't think we, des as human beings, the way we behave in the world, we deserve the capital C in the word civilization, My minor C. And uh, it's because of our economic system. We're still living in a survivalistic system on a different level, but it's still survivalistic. And unless we treat each other as human beings, I'm sorry to inform you that you and I, we don't count as, as human beings. We're just a number. Maybe you're not tattooed like me, but we're just a number in an economic system that's unjust, de destructive, and we have not reached to be the higher beings that we can be and if are. Want, so until the world is fair for everybody, we, we have no right to really see ourselves as being civilized, is your point? Yes, exactly. I, I would agree with you, Bernard. I would agree with you. Do you have, uh, just I'm mindful, I'm just uh, maybe a couple more minutes and then we have to jump off. Bernard, do you are you angry? Do you have any anger? And I mean, not angry toward, I think that you have anger toward uh, the world and a system that's not fair. And, and, and I see that, uh, that inside you. Do you have anger toward Germany, toward the Germans, toward the, the Nazis, toward the people who did, did what they did to you and your family and, and millions of others? And uh, the answer is no. The answer is no. But it com comes up so sometimes the uh, uh, anger. I'll catch myself in being angry. And uh, I say, well, anger is destructive to me. It yes. is not destructive to the SS men, to the Germans. And I tell young German people who come to uh, hear my, my story, I said, you're not at fault of anything, but you have inherited a terrible, terrible, terrible history in your country yeah. and is what it is how you go from here is what how the world will uh, turn out to be bernard you're you're absolutely an amazing you are one of the most remarkable human beings i've ever met and i am so honored and proud to call you a friend and and i hope a close friend and i cannot wait to see you one of the things that's been difficult for me in corona not that these difficulties are anything compared to anything else but is missing people that always visited and that I had the chance to visit. And I, 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 I hope to see you very, very soon. I know you're planning to come back to Krakow. And Bernard, will you ride with me? We didn't get to so many things and ride for the living and everything. Bernard, will you join me again for another interview on the show? And will you ride for me? Will you ride with me again on the bicycle to, from Auschwitz Absolutely. to Krakow? Absolutely. Absolutely. Bernard. Now, that was the most uplifting thing that happened for me in a long, long time. Oh, Bernard, you're so Riding kind. out with so many people from all over the world out yeah. of the hellhole into Krakow and the JCC and something that you organized. I'm Thank grateful you. to you. And, Bernard, uh, I, I am forever in your debt, Bernard. Be well. Send my love to Christina. Kasha also sends her love. We miss you. We love you. We can't wait to see you. And if you're not in Krakow, then this summer, we're going to come visit you in California. Wonderful. Be well, Great. my friend. Take care, Thank Bernard. You. Thank you. You too. Thank tell you. Kevin, tell Calvin I like his work. Shalom, shalom. Tell Kevin. Thank you. Be well, Bernard. Thank mm, you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.